Hello, everybody, and um, welcome to today's to a speaker series event. I'm Erin Laramore, and I am so excited to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Virginia Summy. So Jenny received her PhD in history from UNC Greensboro, along with a post-baccalaureate certificate in African-American and African diaspora studies in December 2017. She also holds an MA in history and a post-bac certificate in women's and gender studies from the University of Montana and a BA in political history from Catawba College. She is a historian and a faculty fellow in the Lloyd International Honors College here at UNCG. And her writing has appeared in awesome places like the North Carolina Historical Review and the Washington Post. So today she is here to talk her about her fantastic new book. I can give you a firsthand account that it is fantastic. The Life of El Rita Melton Alexander, Activism Within the Courts. It was published by the University of Georgia Press just a few weeks ago. Um, and in it, Jenny does a fantastic job of um, combining archival resources, including the Elrita Alexander papers that we have here in special collections and university archives, combining that along with oral history interviews to really explore um, Elrita Alexander's life and contributions. And it's uh, a great, um, it's a great snapshot of a fascinating woman who lived a remarkable life um, and who most folks aren't super familiar with. So with that, thank you, Jenny, for talking with us today. And I will turn things over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Erin. And thank you, Kathleen. And thank you to everybody at, um, at the archives at UNCG. Um, I have been a fan of the archives at UNCG since my master's program. Um, it was during the summer um, and my master's program that um, I first was at the archives there, uh, working with the Alexander Collection, um, actually on my master's thesis, which was <laughs> became the dissertation, which became the book. And I have to say, when I started, um, I just started writing about Judge Alexander when it was just a, a paper for a class I was writing at the University of Montana called Writing Women's Lives. And initially, I wasn't sure when I started my research on her that I was going to be able to find enough information. And so uh, when I came to UNCG and discovered about 200 pages of oral histories that she had done that had never been used, uh, it really provided the foundation uh, for the book. So much of the book, um, a lot of it um, has her own words in it. Um, and so that was really amazing to be able to put uh, her words into print. Uh, and I do have a, um, a brief little um, PowerPoint presentation about her life uh, that will kind of give you the uh, overview of uh, the book. And then I guess we can uh, turn it over for questions. So I'm going to share. Okay. Can everybody see that? There we go. So again, yes, uh, it's the uh, cover of the book. Uh, the cover, and I have to talk about the cover because I love the cover. Um, this was my favorite picture of her. Uh, this is uh, from her 1968 uh, district court campaign. This was the uh, headshot that was used in her uh, uh, campaign materials. And it's it's so hard. Uh, it's just such a, a beautiful picture. And um, Erin Kirk, who was the cover designer for the book, uh, said she really wanted to center that brooch. Um, and if you read the book or if you uh, um, know or knew a lot about uh, Judge Alexander, you know, she loved her fashion and she loved her clothes. Uh, one of my favorite things, it's not in the book, but that I found in her archival collection is uh, receipts from Lord and Taylor and places in New York that we didn't have, certainly did not have in North Carolina in the 1960s. Um, so she loved going up to New York uh, to buy clothes. And I have no doubt that that's probably um, where that outfit came from. <laughs> and you will, you will um, bear with me, I am dealing with allergies just like everybody else uh, right now. Uh, the first chapter of the book really covers her childhood. Uh, she was born in Smithfield, North Carolina in 1919. She was the father of a Baptist minister. And so this is her right, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, uh, but there she is, you can, there she is right there. 
Um, and she was the youngest of three. Um, <clears throat> when she was 12, they moved to Greensboro, North Carolina. And she started uh, Dudley High School early. Uh, her mother was a teacher. And actually, she started the first grade early. So she started at Dudley at, I believe she graduated from Dudley at 15. I want to say she started at Dudley at 12. And then went on to uh, North Carolina A&T, uh, which was also where her older siblings went. And so she followed uh, in that path and ended up graduating at the age of 18. So she was quite... Um, <coughs> I'm sorry, you could call her a, um, now you would probably call her somewhat of a child prodigy. This is one of my favorite pictures um, from the collection. It did not make it into the book because it get it a uh, high enough resolution, but you can see her, she is right there uh, in the front row. Um, and it's actually undated, but um, I have a feeling that is from probably from her Dudley, uh, one of um, the pictures from her Dudley classes. So between two worlds is chapter two, and after A and T, she married her college sweetheart, um, who then subsequently went to Meharry Medical School in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, but they married when she was nineteen years old. Uh, it was not a very good marriage, but we'll get to that. Um, but she ended up going to, well, she ended up working at the A&T library. She worked on a, a city council race. And the person whose race she was working on ended up losing, but told her that she would make a good lawyer. So she ended up going to Columbia Law School. Uh, her husband at the time wanted her to go to New York and live with his mother, and said essentially you know go well, you know, he really didn't care where she went <laughs> and so um she was admitted to um, Columbia at a time when more and more women were going into law school with the lack of men and men being going off to fight in World War II that opened up a lot of spots for women and it wasn't just at Columbia where there were more women coming. Um, also, you know, places like Duke saw um, more women coming to law school during World War II. Uh, she graduated in 1945. Um, Bella Abzug, Representative Bella Abzug, was part of her class. I mean, you've probably heard um, a lot about Constance Baker Motley in the news lately. Uh, Constance Baker Motley was the second Black woman to graduate from Columbia Law after Judge Alexander, but she graduated in 1946. So this was a time when you had uh, quite a bit of women, more women than you would normally have uh, at Columbia Law School. And so her initial plan was to come back to North Carolina where her family was. However, there were several statutes in place that to prevent, specifically to prevent the, um, uh, the acceptance of African-American attorneys into the North Carolina bar. One of them was a statute that said uh, they had to be proven exceptional and meritorious. So it took her several years through this process to actually end up being able to take and get into the North Carolina bar, but to be considered exceptional and meritorious, she had to get affidavits, from the Dean of Columbia Law School, uh, from people at Chapel Hill. And it was really interesting that she was able to receive affidavits and testimony from the folks at Chapel Hill Law School, considering that Chapel Hill had not yet admitted its first black student into the law school. Um, but nonetheless, she was able to, um, to be accepted, um, to just take the bar to begin with. And after some personal setbacks, uh, she becomes the first African-American woman uh, to practice law in the state of North Carolina. There was one woman who had, one Black woman who had taken the bar and had been accepted in North Carolina, but she never ended up practicing. So uh, Judge Alexander ends up being the first Black woman to practice law in the state. Um, these are pictures from her marriage. Um, also not in the book. Um, because they are, you know, they're copies, but this is, this first picture is a, the birth of her son, 
uh, Gerardo Alexander III. And um, I just love this picture because again, it just shows off her fashion sense um, at the time. But this was Tony, her husband. And again, it was a very, um, it was a very disturbing marriage. It was, um, he was, uh, had some alcohol problems and uh, throughout her marriage to him, she was a victim of domestic violence. Um, she frequently, it was, it was kind of an open, an open secret within legal communities in, um, particularly in Greensboro, um, because she said, you know, she would often have to, you know, cover up the bruises that were left on her face uh, from him. Um, but they, it did end up, they stayed married until 1968. Um, it was not until 1968 when North Carolina legislature um, passed that you could have no fault divorces. Uh, in North Carolina. And so uh, if you look in, in, in the rate in North Carolina uh, raises considerably, um, largely because of no far divorces um, and including the Alexander's marriage. Um, but yes, this is um, when Gerardo was born. Um, Gerardo has um, a sad story in and of himself. He was their only child, um, but ended up uh, being a paranoid schizophrenic. Uh, he ultimately dies uh, institutionalized shortly after Judge Alexander dies in the um, late 90s. Um, so there are no descendants. Um, Judge Alexander has no living descendants, um, which I have been in contact with some nieces and nephews of hers, but um, no children that, um, no children and no grandchildren that survive. This is the chapter where I talk about probably one of her most consequential cases as an attorney. Uh, it was the state of North Carolina v. Charles Yeos. In 1964, uh, four Black men were convicted and found guilty of raping a white woman in uh, Jamestown, North Carolina. And so she takes on the case defending just Charles Yeo's. However, uh, the other uh, defendants uh, had public attorneys and had done little and seemed to really care very little about mounting a good defense for their clients. And so Judge Alexander really ends up taking on uh, the defense for the group. They were also tried as a group. And so if one was found guilty of rape, then they were all found guilty of rape. And it was also a 1964 interracial rape case. It was a death penalty case. And so this case ends up changing the jury selection procedures in North Carolina. Of course, she realizes having tried many cases that there are were no black jurors um, on most of the cases that she tried. And so she ended up discovering the jury selection process, which was very convoluted. And it involved a child, you know, this innocent child drawing names out of a box. And, but it turns out that the names had codes behind them. And certain codes meant that you were black, certain codes meant that you were white. And so they ended up going through some like 700 potential jurors uh, for this case before ending up having one um, black man on the case. So when they were found guilty <coughs> and she wanted to have the jury pulled, um, it was ended up being the one black man on the jury who said, guilty, but I want to recommend mercy. And so that one person um, ended up saving the lives of, of all four men. This is just, uh, this is from, and I won't read the whole thing, um, but this is from, um, this is from actually the North Carolina Supreme Court records. So cases, the whole um, boxes, boxes and boxes of um, records from this case are in the state archives in Raleigh. Um, but this is when she's talking about disproportional uh, sentencing for Black men. And so this is something we talk about now, but this is something that she was talking about in 1964. 
she was talking about how about juries and how black men receive harsher treatments and harsher sentences for their crimes and particularly you know, if you look at the last line, you know, approximately 24 Negro lives taken for rape for every one white man. Um, and so this was part of her defense wasn't so much, obviously, um, the, uh, the evidence pointed that they were together that night, whether or not it was consensual or not was really the issue. Um, but because it was an interracial rape case in 1964, they were going to be found guilty. So basically, her task ended up being to save their lives. Um, and, and this was part of that, um, you know, just that the, the disproportional sentencing uh, of Black men in North Carolina. There is a newspaper headline um, after the case that says, you know, Judge Alexander, a reluctant pioneer. And she kind of leans into that a little bit. I claim that in no such way was she reluctant. She, she knew the right things to say um, to the uh, voting public of Guilford County. Um, but when when faced with an opportunity, she definitely took it on. Um, so there was, there was really nothing reluctant. Um, about Judge Alexander. I'm sure it made um, it, uh, I, I say that, you know, she kind of leaned into that because she needed white votes. Um, and the image of a more reluctant pioneer versus, you know, an African American woman who was ambitious and strong and bold um, was more palatable in 1968. But she runs for a district court judge. <laughs> And but the first black woman in the United States to become a district court judge and the first black judge in the state of North Carolina. Uh, while she was on the bench, uh, she was known for uh, some of her uh, innovative uh, judicial programs, one of them being the most prominent being the Judgment Day program. And this goes back to her belief in the disproportional, the disproportionate sentencing of black men. Um, Judgment Day ended up being a forerunner to juvenile deferred sentencing programs um, when it was, when they were not commonly used at all. Um, this was the first, if not one of the first in the country. And so basically if you had um, a young, um, a young person who was, you know, accused of or convicted of a DUI, Uh, should have them mopping up the floors of the ER uh, before before determining their sentence. Um, it did not. It really ruffled the feathers of a lot of people uh, who felt that it placed too much um, too much burden on in the way of judicial discretion. Um, a lot of people really really loved it though. Uh, there are definitely attorneys and. Um, ministers in Greensboro, North Carolina, who say that, you know, I wouldn't be where I am if Judge Alexander had not given me a second chance. And so uh, the program was eventually banned um, in North Carolina, but now we have judicial deferred sentencing programs all over the country. Uh, she held the, she held her, um, her judgeship until 1981, uh, when she stepped down from the bench. Um, and she stepped down from the bench after a um, particularly turbulent time in the 1970s. In 1974, she runs for um, North Carolina, uh, Chief Justice of the North Carolina Supreme Court. This is also one of my other favorite pictures of her. Um, this outfit and that wig is just amazing. Um, but so she's running for Chief Justice of the North Carolina Supreme Court as a Republican. Uh, this is a time when political historians, um, right after a time when political historians refer to as the great white switch, when you had particularly white conservatives fleeing the Democratic Party after the Democratic Party's embrace of civil rights legislation, and they moved to the Republican Party. In turn, you have a Republican Party that welcomes them 
And particularly, I think, you know, Strom Thurmond became a Republican in 1964. Here in North Carolina, uh, Jesse Helms became a Republican in 1970. And so you have most Black voters who were able to vote after the 1965 Voting Rights Act really flee to the Democratic Party. You do have um, a, a handful of of black Republicans remain. And a lot of these black Republicans had, they had a lot in common. A lot of them were very steeped in what we call the politics of respectability. Um, the idea that, and, and, and the very Du Boisian idea of, you know, the talented tenth and uplifting the race. Um, people who you know, still really uh, believed in, you know, kind of pulling yourself up from your bootstrap, so to say, I hate that term, but, um, but for lack of a better term. And so she remains a Republican. Um, in the Republican primary, uh, she was the first to file shortly after she filed. A man by the name of James Newcomb uh, files as well. He was a former lighthouse keeper and fire extinguisher salesman from Eastern North Carolina who did not have a college degree. He ends up, <coughs> sorry, excuse me. He ends up defeating Judge Alexander in the Republican primary. So a man without a college degree defeats a Columbia educated attorney and judge. He um, ends up going on in the general to face Associate Justice of the North Carolina Supreme Court, Susie Sharp. Um, mercifully, Susie Sharp wins and becomes the first uh, Chief Justice, uh, the first female Chief Justice of a, of a state Supreme Court in the country. Um, if you know a whole lot about Susie Sharp, you know, she is in and of herself um, a very um, entertaining character, you could say. Uh, she did not have very nice things to say about Judge Alexander. She was uh, quite racist. But um, ultimately, uh, the fact that a, a fire extinguisher salesman came so close to being Chief Justice of the North Carolina Supreme Court with no legal training, um, they pushed for an amendment to the North Carolina Constitution that um, that said you have to have a law degree in order to be a judge in the state of North Carolina. Very novel concept um, that one should have a law degree. Um, the 70s were also uh, tough in other ways. Uh, she was, uh, her name was mentioned many times for uh, federal appointments, um, particularly in the Nixon administration. Again, and um, I said this the other day that um, you know, staying in the Republican Party really, really hurt her uh, in the 1970s, um, because like I said, in, in 1970, when Jesse Helms becomes a Republican and then becomes a United States Senator as kind of the, you know, de facto leader of the North Carolina Republican Party, you know, they just really did not know what to do with her, um, essentially, at that point anymore. And so, she does not receive the support of the North Carolina Republican Party as her names are being floated for uh, federal nominations and therefore she does not receive them. In 1979, she remarries um, John D. Ralston. So a lot of people, um, if you, a lot of things you'll see about her refer to her as uh, Rita Alexander Ralston. Um, for the book, I chose to use Elrita Melton Alexander because that is the, that was her name throughout 98% of her career. <laughs> um, but she marries uh, John Ralston. He was a white retired IRS agent. Um, and then it was, he dies um, about 10 years later. He dies in the 1980s, leaving her um, widowed. Um, and then she dies on March 14th, 1998. Um, I like this quote, quote from uh, Jim Holzhauser, as you see the drama unfolding, you don't see the big picture, but um, when you look back, hers at the end of the day was a remarkable journey. At the end of the day, hers was a remarkable journey. 
Um, she died, um, she, she really didn't have an illness. It was um, in the mid nineties when her son uh, went through a, um, a murder trial because he stabbed and killed his caretaker um, in a, because of his paranoid schizophrenia. And so a lot of people say that, you know, she died of, you know, she essentially died of a broken heart. Um, her personal life had taken its toll um, towards the end of her life. The, um, the abuse, everything she went through with her son, I call her just a brilliant compartmentalizer. Uh, the way she was able to uh, have this amazing groundbreaking career um, in the midst of such personal turmoil and tragedy. Um, but uh, she died, her, um, her ashes are buried behind a, um, a nursing home um, owned by some um, friends uh, in Greensboro. And, um, and so lately um, there have been, um, since I've been researching her, there have been more uh, things about uh, Judge Alexander in, in, in Greensboro, but um, shortly before she died, um, I believe it's courtroom 2A in the Guilford County Courthouse um, is dedicated to her and has a portrait of her that really actually doesn't look like her very much. Um, and there is also a, um, she's in a mural in the Greensboro Public Library uh, as well. Um, but um, until now, uh, she has been uh, remembered fondly by uh, the people she worked with. And so hopefully uh, we will be seeing more uh, tributes to Judge Alexander around town. Um, this is just the book information uh, where uh, you can find it on uh, UGA Press. You can also find it you know, on Amazon and um, hopefully it's covered on books. Um, or your local bookseller. So with that, I will open it up. Awesome. Um, does anyone have a question? I have a lot. So I'll let <laughs> other people ask questions first though. Thank you for, for sharing that. And like I said before, the book is fantastic. So everyone should get a copy. Well, I'll start with my questions since I don't see any okay. questions. Oh no, yeah, okay. Great presentation. Everyone is clapping. <laughs> so can you talk, you talked about, about um, that you started learning or you started researching Elria Alexander when you were um, working on your master's degree, but can you talk a little bit about how you learned about her and how you started, how you started that? Yeah. So <laughs> it's kind of a long story. Um, I'm a native North Carolinian. Um, I'm from Rutherford County originally, um, the same place where like my eighth great grandfather was born in Rutherford County. Um, and so when I graduated from undergrad, I did my undergrad at Catawba College in Salisbury. I did an AmeriCorps VISTA project. I moved across the country. I love mountains. I'm from the mountains. Uh, so I stayed. And when I started my program, master's program at UM, um, I decided that it would be really cool to write about a woman from North Carolina. Um, it was also at that time when I was taking programs at, at the University of Montana, the African American Studies Department is housed within the history program. And so I was taking a lot of classes in uh, the African American Studies program with Dr. Tobin Miller Shear, who's amazing. And I found myself learning um, about the African American history of North Carolina more than I had ever learned growing up in North Carolina. <laughs> and so I was a little like, what, what, you know, what the, what, the what? And decided that, you know, and at that point it was, I felt like my master's program, well, I feel like when you work in academia, it's really just, you know, a, a constant study in finding out what you don't know. Um, and I was introduced to that in my master's program, like, what do I not know, particularly about the Black history of North Carolina and where I grew up. And so I thought it would be great to, to write about, you know, a Black woman that not only that, if I, I figured being a like ninth generation North Carolinian, there are a lot of people that a lot of us don't know about. Um, so I'm sitting in my 
in my apartment in Missoula, Montana, and I come across this name. I think it was on the North Museum website, and it was 1968. Judge Alexander becomes the first African American um, black woman on the bench, and I was like, "Who is that?" And that was <laughs> that was how it started. Um, again, uh, I was you know fortunate enough to be able to come home and and continue the research at, at UNCG. But yeah, um, I was able to gather enough to write a, a paper for my class uh, and then turn it into a turn it into a master's thesis. But she is, I mean, she is those papers, those papers that you in, in that you house um, are the reason I, I applied to the PhD program at UNCG. I wanted to continue this work. And so, yeah, they are, she is, y'all are the reason that, that I came home. I'm glad we drug you back from Montana. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have a question in the chat. Was there something that was difficult to find out about her life? Any struggles in your archival research? I think just some of her, um, I, I, I say in the introduction, you know, there are Sometimes I'm able to find a justification for her actions in her words or in, you know, available historiography. And sometimes I'm just like, I don't know why she did that. For instance, you know, um, she defended members of the Ku Klux Klan before she became a judge. And, you know, she... I kind of rationalize it away a little bit. You know, she's recently divorced. She has a sick son, you know, she, she was by no means struggling financially, but I'm sure she didn't ever want to be in that position. She says that she defended them because she was able to convert them, <coughs> excuse me, um, away from white supremacy. <laughs> um, but I was just, I kept looking for like more of a reason why she would do that. Um, and so, yeah, there were definitely a few things where I was like, I, I don't, I don't understand that. I guess I don't have to understand that. You know, everybody is, everybody's complicated. Um, also, you know, why she stayed in the Republican Party. I have found lots of, um, she said she did it for the sake of integration. I think that sounds a little shallow, actually. Not, not on her part, but just like not a very nuanced reason why you would stay is stay in the party that is you know embracing this you know southern strategy and so you know I did find in the available historiography a lot of characteristics of black republicans during that time that that fit with her um but at the same time I'm like surely she saw the writing on the wall right <laughs> um but yeah so there are definitely a few things that were hard to um hard to get to the root of definitely yeah um if anyone else has questions please feel free to put them in the chat um i wanted to just ask you to talk a little bit um you know i think you, there was a recent time magazine article um about uh our new supreme court justice and it mentions el rita alexander as well as i believe constance motley Baker in it. But um, can you talk a little bit about Judge Alexander's long legacy kind of here, but also on the national level? Yeah. Um, you know, and that goes to a lot of people have asked me, you know, why do we know about Constance Baker Motley and not about Judge Alexander? Um, and, I, and I think that part of that has to do with the fact that, you know, Constance Baker Motley did get those, that, that federal, those federal appointments that, that Judge Alexander did not um, as far as locally goes, and I say that she wasn't a traditional uh, civil rights activist, you know, that she, she would do really, it was some of her forms of activism that really drew me in. Uh, for instance, that she would say, you know, she would go up to a group of white male attorneys and say, I'm going to see what the difference is between this white water and this colored water, and then go drink from the white water fountain and nobody had the guts to stop her. 
or when she would try and try a case from the segregated section of the courtroom and they would say no you need to come down to the bench you're trying this case and she said no I'm just you know following the letter of the law um you know where my people are so it was those types of, of things that really drew me in but I've said that you know you're not going to find any pictures of her protesting outside of Woolworths um, you know, around February 1st. Those don't exist, but you do see pictures of her in her judicial robes. And those are the pictures, those being her being the first um, Black woman to practice law in the state, or being the first Black judge in the state, um, that are her longest lasting legacy that inspired, I, I mean, w women I talked to, um, particularly uh, former Supreme Court Justice, um, Patricia Timmons Goodson, Sherry Beasley, I all had the privilege of talking to them and they said, you know, those were the pictures that, that were like, hey, I can do this. I, I, I can do this too someday. And so, you know, you know, we'll see Sherry Beasley as, you know, our next state senator. And so all of these are, you know, these long legacy of, of, of Judge Alexander. Yeah. Um, so I have one more question, but again, if anyone has questions, put them in the chat window and I'm more than happy to ask them for you. So one of my favorite things about this book is honestly that it's one of my favorite historical, I don't know, historiography styles, which is just a biography that focuses in very narrowly on a person, but really tells a big regional history and ties in kind of with big stories of local history, and then honestly, current events. Can you talk a little bit just, you know, you've talked a lot about L. Reed Alexander, but I also know that you teach a course in the Honors College um, that's focused on um, Greensboro history and using Greensboro as a lens mm -hmm. to study um, more, bigger historical events. Can you talk a little bit about that and the way that local can play a role in studying the global? Yeah, uh, Greensboro really is kind of a second character. Uh, in the book. Um, and part of what I wanted to do is show that, you know, Greensboro has a very rich civil rights history beyond February 1st. You know, not to take anything away from February 1st and the ANT4, there was a lot else going on with the Bennett Bells, with um, people like George Simpkins who come up in the book, and with people like, um, like Judge Alexander. Um, and so, um, I, I, I say that it would have been hard for her to have done what she did, particularly in 1968, in a place other than Greensboro. Of course, um, you know, in 1980, uh, Dr. William Chape wrote a book called Civilities and Civil Rights, which talks about Greensboro's progressive mystique. And that, you know, Greensboro, yeah, okay, it's a little progressive. It's not as, it was not as progressive as white people thought it was um, at all, and I and I and I, I I stick to that. But I think I try not to push on it too much. But I do say that you know you had two HBCUs in Greensboro in the 1960s. You didn't have that other places, um, and you did have a um, a thriving black professional community uh, in Greensboro, particularly in the mid century. Um, one of my favorite pieces is the. Greensboro or is the Carolina Peacemaker headline from 1968 that has judge or he wasn't judge yet representative Henry Fry on one side you know when he becomes the first um, African-American elected to the North Carolina legislature since reconstruction and her on the other side that they had both been elected um, uh, from Greensboro and those are just images that you're not going to see in a lot of other southern cities in the 1960s. Um, I mean, when it comes to, you know, when it, that doesn't really answer the global aspect of your question, <laughs> um, but, you know, Gre Greensboro as, as compared to, you know, other cities has, um, you know, of course, Greensboro is not a perfect city, but it has been on, you know, on the vanguard of a lot of, um, on a lot of civil rights issues, particularly during this time. And, and uh, Judge Fry and Judge Alexander are 
are, are you know, evidence of that. Yeah, I think she, I mean, she's a, it's, she's a fascinating woman to, to learn about and lived a fascinating life. Um, I will say, so for folks who want to see some of the primary sources, we totally didn't do this in time for it to be useful for Jenny when she was writing her book and doing <laughs> the research. But uh, thanks to the folks in the library's um, electronic resources and information technology department, um, Elrita Alexander's papers have been digitized. Um, I'll put the link to that in the chat. So you can click there and see a lot of the materials that Jenny worked with, a lot of Elrita Alexander's um, correspondence and other other bits and pieces. But honestly, um, the, the book does such a good job of streaming all that together along with oral history interviews from people who knew her to, to kind of help fill in a lot of gaps and honestly ask a lot of extra questions that, um, you know, I think if, if you're interested in learning more, it's a, it's a great way to do that. Um, I'm seeing Patrick says hey, he's upset you and see if you didn't get any of her clothing or brooches. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I, I've never actually seen in person any of her um, clothing or brooches. A lot of her personal effects went to um, the person who ended up being her son's caretaker after her death. And um, so, I'm not, so I'm not sure what happened to them, honestly. <laughs> um, but yes, I would, yeah. Oh gosh, I'd love to see, you know, some of her clothes <laughs> and if they're, if they're still around at all. Um, <laughs> Yeah, every photo she is like styled to the nuns. It's it's yes. awesome. It's yeah, her um hair makeup, pearls, everything. Yeah, and, and she's quite and she talk about you know some of her um some of her background. Um if she was biracial, her uh this is where it's interesting. And if you get to read the research of another plug for uh UNCG. Warren Miltier were on the um, free people of color in northeastern North Carolina. Both of her parents were from the you know, Great Dismal Swamp area. Um, and like uh, her father was from Gates County. Uh, her mother was from nearby. And so they were part of that. She comes from that long line of bi and tri-racial people um, of that area. So um, that was another thing going back to that question of, you know, things that were hard to figure out. Um, census records <clears throat> are, excuse me, are incredibly difficult for the early 20th century uh, for people of color. Um, she describes uh, her grandfathers as white. However, they are listed as I almost never saw them listed as white in census records. They were listed as mulatto or, or other <laughs> or Negro. Um, and so it, it was, it's a really interesting story. And I'm glad that Warren wrote the book that he does because, you know, I couldn't get into all of that, <laughs> you know, talking about her childhood, but that she has a very diverse um, uh, racial background. And so, yeah. We have one more question. Can you speak a bit more about how she interacted with the court, her presentation of cases and interactions during trials? Yes, I have heard people that would go to court just to watch her. <laughs> that people would come, you know, just to kind of, not to see the show, um, but she had, um, <coughs> sorry. Um, but she was um, extremely sharp, extremely quick-witted. And so one of my favorite lines is where uh, you have a mother who's talking about how her daughter is, quote, you know, quote, unquote, running around with colored boys. And she looks down and she says, you know, darling, have you looked at your judge? You know, <laughs> like, hello. Um, and so, um, and I, I also love that that she would allegedly, apparently, uh, when handling divorce cases, if men found out that Judge Alexander was handling their case, <laughs> would burst into tears because they knew they were going to lose. Uh, she was not always 
you know, particularly um, generous to men in divorce cases. Um, but just that she was so, um, I don't want to use the word flamboyant, but so alive <laughs> in these, in her presentation, in her, um, you know, when she was a judge. Um, there are also some great stories from when she was a judge. Uh, she took this cue from Clarence Darrow, who was, you know, the monkey scope trials in, in Tennessee, but um, apparently Clarence Darrow would put a wire in his cigar and to distract the jurors, he would keep smoking to see how long, you know, and they'd be looking to see how long the ash would get. <laughs> um, and apparently she would, just when women wore hats, you know, in court, and she would take out her hat pin and she would twirl it and apparently twirl it precariously close to like her defendant's ear or something like that. And it would distract, you know, distract the jury. Uh, so she definitely um, had, uh, her interactions were unique. And, and, and part of what made her, part of what made me want to write about her was that she was very bold at a time when um, women, let alone Black women, were not expected or boldness was particularly appreciated. Um, and, she, and she went for it. Um, so yeah, those were some of the most, some of the most fun um, parts to write about was just her, just her presentation style. I think one of my favorite pieces of the book is at the very end where you're talking about you have a quote from her retirement when they hung her portraits in the courthouse. Can you talk a little bit? Do you remember that quote? Because it's yes. literally my favorite like the, quote of hers. Oh, she said something you know, very humbled and overwhelmed by all the accolades, although I definitely deserve most of them. <laughs> Was that it? Yeah. 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 Um, she's she like, did. That she this. definitely this did deserve it. <laughs> and I just, I loved the, you know, I'm overwhelmed and humbled, but, but yeah, yeah, I deserve this. I'm kind of awesome. <laughs> she, and, and, and she knew it. Um, part of that was, and I'm actually kind of looking for it, but yeah, she, um, one of the things, I think she was so confident. She was, she was a daddy's girl. She was always, you could probably say her father's favorite. Um, and so I think she always just had, despite everything that happened to her, um, she, from the very beginning, her foundation that her, that her parents established and that her father established. And so she always knew um, I think it was, it was in her, in her retirement in one of the Greensboro papers that said, you know, from a young age, people started noticing the youngest daughter of, of JC and, and um, Ellie Melton, and they haven't stopped since. So she was, she was born, you know, and I talk about performance activism in the book. Um, and she talks about, you know, having wanting, wanted to have been, been a performer. She was actually, you know, um, in college, she was actually a music major. Um, uh, she was classic. She was a, a classical pianist and, and trained singer. And so uh, she knew a little bit about performance uh, going into things. And uh, she, can, she maintains it well. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Danny, <laughs> thank Dr. You. Dr. Summy. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, this is um, this was fascinating, and I think it's a story everybody needs to know, but sadly they don't. So now they can, and I'm so excited by that. So thank you for joining us, and thank you everybody else who participated. Um, have a good rest of the day. Great. Thank, thank you. you.